Years ago, a pop song was released by songwriter Paul Simon called 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. He's probably right. There's lots of ways to lose your lover, but few things are more destructive on a relationship than jealousy. And jealousy is not limited to the realm of romance. At its core, jealousy is a toxic mixture of fear and selfishness. Fear of losing our status and selfish of another person's success. As Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman will discover in 1 Samuel chapters 18 and 19, the cancer of jealousy, if left unchecked, will eat away at the relationships you value the most, including your relationship with your Lord. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life, into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through 1 Samuel. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to 1 Samuel chapters 18 through chapter 20 as we join their discussion. Boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, jealousy. Ah, oh, that's been the theme of countless novels and movies. But does jealousy spread beyond romance to the rest of our life? Nathan, Vicki, have you ever seen jealousy spread outside of husband, wife, boy, girl relationships? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. I remember I was serving under a pastor and I didn't realize it until after the fact, uh, but he, he was incredibly jealous uh, of everyone. And I also didn't realize until after I had left employment at that particular church that our emails were being monitored. Mm. And so I had a fairly good relationship with him, even though I kind of knew that, you know, he had some some issues going on. And I had preached one Sunday and it was a good sermon. I thought I thought it went well. It was well received. I received an email from someone in the congregation who said this was a wonderful sermon. It was fantastic. And then she wrote and I had barely had contact with this person, but she said that was one of the best sermons I've ever heard. It was far better than Pastor So and So, and I wish you would preach more often than him. <laughs> and like I, I didn't even respond to that because my dad told me never write anything in an email you don't want the whole world to see, right. and I think that's good wisdom. And so I did not respond at all. And this took me years later to figure this out what happened. And all of a sudden, my relationship with this pastor just soured like almost overnight, and I had no clue what had happened or what I had done. And after I've put the pieces together over the course of years, I'm like, oh, my goodness, it started with that email. He saw that and was like, mm -hmm. ah, no way. I am the preacher of this church. I'm going <laughs> to there's no way this guy is going to get anywhere at this church. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I've seen ro outside of romantic relationships, uh, jealousy uh, run amok. And, and it really did damage some relationships I had with people because he, he turned a few people against me. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. I think that it's all too common for us in um, church ministry to be jealous of other people's success, to see somebody else in a different situation really begin to thrive and uh, want, want that for ourselves, to be jealous of, of their success. I think it's true in business. I think it's true of all of life. I think you can have people being jealous of other people in your own secular profession who have done better than you are in investment or climbing the ladder or in sales or whatever, to want what they have. And, uh, you know, I'll confess that uh, we, I can see it in others, but uh, there are times when I've seen it in myself. <laughs> if I had the chance to have uh, asked God for a gift, I would have asked for music. I get jealous of other people and their ability to harness uh, instruments or their voice to uh, to express what they're saying. Yeah, I wish I had that. I don't. Anytime I've tried to sing, people have agreed with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a good point you put out too there, is we all have the capacity for professional or interpersonal jealousy. I, I can remember looking at a couple that was living outside of wedlock when I was at a particular time of life, I was married, but we had a rent and, 
we didn't have a lot. And here this couple is and they're renting a house and they've got all sorts of money and they're driving these gorgeous cars. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at this going, are you kidding me, Lord? Really? They're not living the life that they're supposed to be living and they get all this stuff. And meanwhile, we're scraping by and we're overdrawn every payday because we, we can't make ends meet here. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and the psalmist himself says how often, uh, you know, he wrestles with his envy of the wicked. They have no struggles. They have no problems. And uh, here am I serving you and look at my situation. Mm. Yeah. Uh, jealousy is common in life, I think. And uh, certainly we see it in the life of Saul, uh, starting in chapter 18 and going through to verse 20. <laughs> he fell into it full bore. Uh, it begins in chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. Vicki, would you read that for us? Sure, I will. It says, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant with David, took off the robe he was wearing, and gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Uh, Nathan, what's the significance of that, of him taking off his tunic and giving his weapons to, to David? What, what's, what's going on there? These are his personal effects, his personal items, not only that, but royal items. Mm. He is sharing himself in, an, in a symbolic way, his title, with David. Yeah, he's like saying, you're my equal, right? Yeah. I mean, Jonathan here has an, obviously has an extraordinary relationship with David. <laughs> Despite what some liberal commentators would say, nothing romantic, nothing untoward that's going on here. But I can see why they would have a strong bond. I mean... We have just seen David taking on Goliath with a tremendous act of faith. But but remember back in chapter 14, when Jonathan had did something similar, and when he took on the whole Philistine army at Michmash, well, his father sat under the pomegranate tree. So both were men of faith and courage with a devotion to the Lord and to each other. But could it be that uh, this is the seed of some jealousy? Because did David have a better relationship with Jonathan than Saul had with his own son? Oh, absolutely. You remember back in that battle, Saul was so upset with Jonathan for getting the glory that he wanted to kill him. (laughs) Right. But it got worse. We read in verse 5 and chapter 18 that whatever mission Saul sent David on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. And while that was good news for Saul at first, yeah, it turned negative. Because in verse 6, we read what happened? It says, when the men were returning home, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres, and they were dancing. And as they did, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. (laughs) (laughs) That got Saul's attention. Why? Oh, wow. I mean, how would you like it? You're pretty, but she's 10,000 times more beautiful. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think I'm going to say that to my wife. Yeah, he's smart, but he's 10,000 times brighter. I mean, gee whiz. So David was outshining him. The spotlight was shifting away from Saul to David. And in verse 8, we know that's true, because the narrator tells us very clearly what? So Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They, You know, it is a, a tacky thing to do. They were singing. I mean, they're singing it even. <laughs> Ding dong, the witches did. They have, they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? Ah, Nathan, doesn't that sound a little bit familiar to your situation in the past? It sure did, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Please stop singing that song and never sing it again. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Saul is upset because these are his people. He wants their acclaim. He wants their respect. He wants their approval. He doesn't want to share it with anyone, right? He doesn't want it to go even to his son. He wants it all for himself. Who do the people of Israel belong to? I mean, whose people are they? The Lord God Almighty. (laughs) Isn't that what Moses pointed out in Deuteronomy chapter 7? 
Yeah, it says, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Ah, so the people are his, they're not Saul's. Right. And David will also agree with that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, when he says, how great are you, sovereign Lord, and who is like your people, the one nation on earth that God went to redeem as people for himself. You have established your people, Israel, as your very own forever. I think what's happening here is Saul is losing sight of whose people he was leading. For him, it was all about him. And you can see that in how he begins to act. In verses 10 and 11, what happens? Wow, this is kind of creepy. It says, the next day, an evil spirit from God. Hmm. Wow, an evil spirit from God. I'm going to say that again. An evil <laughs> spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. And while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did, Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Woof. So he is so jealous that um, he tries to kill him by throwing a spear at him. In verse 13, he continues. It said, Saul sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful David was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. So he keeps sending him out to battle, hoping that uh, he doesn't return. But what happens? He gets better and better. He sends him on suicide missions, and he actually wins. <laughs> and uh, Saul's attitude, you suspect, turned in what direction? Murderous. <laughs> so... Saul changed tactic. He offered his daughters in a type of bribe. Now, that's, that's low, isn't it? Yeah. Chapter 18, verse 25, we read, The king wants no other price for the bride other than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take mm. revenge on his enemies. Oof. And the narrator said, what was his reason for that? Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. So he's selling his daughters in a way to get David to go into a military situation where he will die. I, I, I mean, this is jealousy run amok. This Let me is just say, he must have had some hot daughters. <laughs> yeah, really, because like if David takes this up, which he does, like, why do you want to marry into this madness, dude? <laughs> you already seen the madness of King Saul. Why, why get involved? I think Vicky's correct. She mu they must have been incredibly attractive. <laughs> wow. So did his jealous plan work? Without even reading it, I'm telling you, it did. <laughs> David took his men with him and went out and killed 200 Philistines. And you know, they weren't just like lining up, waiting no. patiently to be circumcised. <laughs> and brought back their foreskins. God. They counted out the full number to the king so that David might become the king's son-in-law. And then when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter, Michael, loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. Now, isn't it interesting that he didn't embrace him? I mean, David is his best warrior. He's advancing the kingdom. He is accomplishing things that Saul could never have accomplished. But Saul doesn't care about that because what is he concerned about? He's jealous. He's jealous. His name, his reputation, his glory. And he becomes even more desperate. In chapter 19, verse 8, we read that once more war broke out. And David went out and fought the Philistines, and he struck them with such force they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with a spear in his hand. And while David was playing the lyre, now this sounds like a repeat. What did he do? He tries to kill Try. him. He tries to kill him. Tries to spear him like a pig. <laughs> well, I guess it wouldn't have been a pig. They wouldn't have had pig. That was not kosher. Yeah, it wasn't kosher. Yeah. Spear him like a goat. 
It's fascinating that this jealousy is just increasing and increasing in, uh, in this extent. And it gets even worse because in chapter 20, verse 30, it spills over when he realizes that Jonathan is actually helping David. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to him, what? What did the father say to his son? He said, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. Oof. Oof. Yeah, we have similar phrases in English, which we can't repeat here. And, <laughs> and it really, that, it's like one of the worst things you could say to somebody. Oh, especially right? your son. Right. Your, your own son's mom, your wife. Right. I know. Just horrendous. And he's so upset and so angry that in verse 33, what does he do with Jonathan? Oh, he hurled his spear at him. <sighs> Saul becomes so obsessed with his own reputation, status, and power that nothing else matters. I mean, he, he, he's collapsing into a pool of selfishness and a totally ineffective leader. Mm. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. Well, I, just imagine the people in his court. They know when he gets angry, start ducking, right? He's just going <laughs> to grab his spear and throw it. In fact, if I was making a Saul action figure, his action feature, when you squeeze his legs together, he'd just throw a spear, right? That would be, that's his thing, right? I'm angry. I'm going to throw a spear. It's just, and the respectability that his nobles would have and that the people attended to him, it, it would just go in the toilet. So the yeah. irony is that he just destroyed his own reputation through this act of, of jealousy. People would look at him and say, no, no way. You're crazy. Who wants to follow this? You have no self-control. Saul didn't want God to use anyone but him. His ministry really became about himself, didn't it? And how often do we see people descend into that kind of jealousy? Turns out that Rather than praying, thy kingdom come, it can easily become my kingdom come. Right. Well, and, and the interesting thing, we see it not just in, quote unquote, ministry within church, but the ministry that we have within everyday life, mm -hmm. right? We, we've gotten, at least in America, from what I've seen, this idea that God wants to fulfill my dreams. What dreams do you have? And how can I have God or how can you get God to fulfill your dreams? Because God's the one that put those dreams in your heart to begin with. Well, Jeremiah 17, 9, right? The heart is deceitful. Who can understand it? All the dreams and desires I have, they don't matter compared to the will of God. I need to take my dreams, desires, place them before Christ and see what he does with them. I mean, he's going to change them. He's going to hone them. He's going to create them. He's going to kill them sometimes and give me a better dream. His will be done not mine. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're uh, working as a police officer, you're working in sanitation, uh, you're working in the business world, right? We have to take those plans that we have and give them to God rather than say, God, you conform, you conform your will to my dreams. You need to empower what I want to do here because I want to do it for you, which I think is the way that we deceive ourselves, which is probably what happened to Saul. Right. But if jealousy is wrong, and clearly we're seeing it, uh, we're seeing it described as such in this book, why is it okay for God to be jealous? I mean, in Exodus 20, verse 5, God commands his people who should worship no other gods because, and he says, and I quote, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So if God can be jealous, why can't we be jealous? Because he is worthy and we're not worthy. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're his servants and he is our husband. It's like as a wife, there, there's a righteous jealousy. If, if I'm married, I, mm -hmm. I have a right to be jealous of my husband's with other women. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, there, there is a righteous jealousy. He, he is greater and he, he loves us. Yeah, no, that's a really good metaphor. We are the bride of Christ. We are not the husband. He is God, and we are not. To him goes all praise and all honor, but not to us, because we are the bride, and he is the husband. 
We see that so clearly described in Hosea chapter 2, right? Do you remember what the prophet says there about God's relationship with his people? Hosea 2 says, Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. John the Baptist certainly got that right. He says in John chapter 3, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. So he must become greater, and I must become less. Fact is, unlike Saul, we need to realize that ministry is not and has never been about us. It's not a career. It's not a job. It's not even a profession. It's a sacred responsibility to bring people, God's people, in harmony with the lover of their soul, with the God who loves them the most. We may be the best man, but God is their bridegroom, and we can never forget our place. Selfishness, jealousy, is the sign of a lost leader. I think that's why Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder, be shepherds of God's flock, watching over them, not because you must, because you are willing not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. We point others to him, never to ourselves, because God will not share his glory with another. He is a jealous God. Selfishness is the sign of a lost leader. It can be tempting to want someone we compete with to fail and us to win. However, when our pride wants a spiritual rival to fail, we are lost. I trust that today's discussion of God's word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on your social media and telling your friends. Tune in next Friday as we continue our discussion through 1 Samuel. Be sure to join us.